The title for the chapter in Brother Layton's book and for this lesson is Just One Touch. And you'll see why as we go to God's Word. And I'll remind you, not that you need me to remind you, that the very best thing that you will hear today or any other day is God's Word. I'm going to read Mark 5, verses 24 through 34. I've got my New International Version here, the old version of the New International Version. I would ask that you read along. Uh, especially if your version is a different version, uh, and then take note of of what might be different. All right, Mark 5, verses 24 through 34. A large crowd followed and pressed around Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus is known for a lot of things today. Some of the things that he's known for are lies that are told and repeated by our enemy to profane his name. Evils that are done falsely in the name of Christ. Hatred that's being taught as being pleasing to Jesus. And blasphemies that are posing as art or as science. But what the perishing see as foolishness, namely a Savior on a cross, is what those of us who are being saved see as the power of God, 1 Corinthians 1.18. And beyond his sacrifice for sin is his use of both parables and miracles like this one to teach us about Jesus' love. Lots of the many miracles recorded in the Gospels uh, involve healing. And the ones that we've got recorded uh, are the only, uh, let's see, the ones that we have here are the only ones that have been recorded. There there are probably lots of others. Indeed, John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31 says, what we have recorded is to show who Jesus was, not to keep score. Oh, there's another one. Tally it up. Uh, For example, when Jesus fed the 5,000 in Matthew 14, He saw the crowd, he loved them, and he healed their sick. How many of their sick did he heal? I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Probably a lot. Sometimes, whenever Jesus would heal, he was asked to heal. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, heal me. My daughter, for example, the, the context, the bigger context of this in Jairus. <clears throat> Sometimes Jesus chose someone to heal. He kind of went out of his way to identify someone who had a need and healed that person. And at least once, Jesus seemed to have been surprised to have healed someone. In this lesson, we're going to focus on that surprise healing that involved a woman suffering from an issue of blood, as it's recorded in the King James Version that I learned growing up. We're going to see how her interaction with Jesus shows her journey from hopelessness through the way points of hope sparked, to hope sensed, to the confidence of hope seen. And this hope seen, this is an humble confidence of hopefulness, hopefulness, 
that is the fullness of hope. And just like last week in the story about Jesus touching the leper, three of the Gospels record this event. You can find it in Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. You see it in Mark chapter 5, 24 through 34, which I read to you this morning. It's also in Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. In Mark's account, we get more details, more verses, more details. Uh, Jesus was on the way to heal the daughter of a Jewish synagogue official named Jairus. Now, I pronounce it Jairus. I come from the south. Maybe y'all like Jairus. You may also have heard Jarius. They get the eye out of the way. It's that fella. How have you pronounced the name? It's this guy who was a big shot Jewish synagogue official. As Jesus made his way to the house of this here Jairus, uh, he was surrounded by a large crowd. And like I said last week, this large crowd included not all just wonderful people. There were wonderful people in the crowd for sure, but there were also some folks who followed Jesus with a hidden agenda. Some of them wanted to follow Jesus because of the entertainment value. I mean, who wouldn't want to see wonders performed that that seemed to happen with some frequency around this fellow? Some folks wanted a free lunch. You know, if he's feeding everybody, might as well get a free meal out of this. Some followed him with an evil intent. They wanted to discredit his claim of being the Messiah. Or they wanted to catch him in a contradiction. Or they wanted to get him to say something that they would consider to be blasphemy. However, on the positive side, some people follow Jesus to learn from his teachings. I think we'd probably be in this group here on a Sunday morning. We're among those folks. We're following Jesus to learn from his teachings. There are others, though, who were in those crowds who followed specifically to be healed or to receive some other kind of miracle. Whatever the reason, among the crowd pressing in on Jesus on this specific occasion was a very faithful but very hopeless person who desperately needed what only Jesus could offer. So as the event unfolds here in Mark chapter 5, We see this woman in the crowd who'd been suffering from bleeding for 12 years. It says she had spent all that she had in failed attempts to be cured, but she remained unclean. And her uncleanness is kind of like the uncleanness of the leper that we looked into last week. Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 through 27, goes into a little more detail about a woman with an issue of blood and how that makes this person unclean, anybody, not just her, but anybody who was hanging out with her or even touching her or anything that she wore or anything that she had held on to, as long as her bleeding continued, she was unclean, the person hanging out with her would be unclean, the person touching her would be unclean, and so on. There's a lot of uncleanness going on. So kind of like the leper, This woman was forced to live a lonely existence. For 12 years she'd been in this situation. Scripture tells us that she suffered physically. And we see she suffered financially. I mean, it says she spent all she had. So she was impoverished by this. Now, I suspect that she probably suffered emotionally from isolation. She suffered socially. She couldn't be around people. And she suffered spiritually. She couldn't be in communion with the saints. In that day would have been her co-religionists. And maybe, maybe you've been in this situation before. Maybe you've experienced a long-term disease. Or maybe you've had to be quarantined. And, and I'm not thinking about COVID. We'll get to that in a minute. But whenever you're going through chemotherapy, I know for Kim it was this way, very few people could be around her. And, and we had little kids at the time, and our kids couldn't come into the hospital room where Kim was for a month and a half while she was undergoing her, her chemotherapy treatment. And, and so I've not experienced that personally, but through my wife, I experienced not being able to be around her, and certainly the kids couldn't. Um, we could stand, we were on, a, it was a fourth floor hospital, so we couldn't be outside the window. Um, uh, but we could, I could bring the kids to the hallway. 
and they could look in the door of her room. It was a laminar flow room, they call it, so it had this big vent thing, like when you go into the Walmart, sometimes they got that big wind blowing down on you, and that keeps the uh, inside separate from the outside through just wind. It was a room like that, and we could stand outside and like wave and talk, uh, but couldn't get close. So tough with kids. Tough, uh, tough situation. So for those of us who haven't experienced that, which I'm sure some of us have experienced that, for those of us who hadn't, maybe we got a little dose of that when COVID was going on. Our COVID quarantines, stuck in our houses maybe, um, teleworking, um, not able to go into the stores, shopping in person. Um, maybe uh, some military folks around in this area, maybe you've been deployed to a truly remote location where you're out of touch with your family, maybe even out of touch with your military community to some degree. And it may be that someone who's streaming this class right now, watching live with us, or maybe watching it later, is shut inside their home. Someone who's in a skilled nursing facility away from us. Maybe somebody is on a nuclear submarine somewhere. I don't know. It's, it's possible this is made available. Um, Maybe somebody at a radar station, the remote corners of Greenland, um, or somewhere else. Yeah, yeah there's, there's remote spots where, where people are away. This woman in this story, she knows how you feel. We're going to learn a little bit of that as we experience her story through the eyes of the gospel. Feeling isolated. In the context of this event, this woman was nowhere near the social status or economic position of the synagogue official that Jesus was walking along with that day. But only one thing, not her social status, not, not her economic position, only one thing could offer her a spark of hope. And you can see it in her thoughts, which are recorded for us in Inspired Word. She thought that if she could just touch Jesus' clothes, she could be healed and return to a normal life. Matthew's version of the story says she touched the fringe of his garment. Now, the fringe of the garment means the hem at the bottom, so like on my jeans. It's this part right down here at the bottom, around the ankle. Later, we'll come back to this, but later both Matthew and Mark say in general, that sick people would beg to touch the fringe of Jesus' garment. Now, to me, that's plenty of evidence that this woman that we're talking about here in Mark chapter 5 did not walk up to him and lay a hand on his shoulder. Right? If she's touching the hem of the garment, she's not starting up here. It also means to me that she didn't touch his elbow. Sometimes... Uh, like we try to teach our kids, if you need to get someone's attention, you come up and unobtrusively touch their elbow. She's not reaching here to touch his elbow. She's not reaching to catch his garment at the wrist down by his waist. She's got to come way down low to touch the fringe of the garment at his ankle. That's not a position of pride. That's not a position of equality. If you come up to somebody like this, you're in a position of humility, in a subservient position. And kind of like the leper from last week who bowed low, she was following Jesus' example of humility, his teaching about humility. These people, the leper last week and this woman this week, are coming to Jesus humbly harboring a spark of hope. And then we get to see the good thing happen. <clears throat> the wonder of this miracle, we get to see that happen for us. She sneakily made her way through the crowd, and I say sneaky. Either she was bold and just pretended like she didn't have an issue of blood and was making everybody unclean as she jostled her way through, <clears throat> or maybe she tried to kind of go around, around, tried to not touch anybody, whatever. But she had to sneak through the crowd. She couldn't be, um, uh, a, she wasn't somebody who got standing that she could walk with Jesus. She's sneaking around through the crowd. She makes her way to be close enough to touch him. 
And she knows all the while that she's going through the crowd that she's breaking the rules. Not only is she breaking the rules for herself, but she's causing everybody that she touches, everybody whose, whose clothes she touches, or who touches her clothes, to be ceremonially unclean. This is an act that seems to me to be laced with desperation. Finally, Jesus maybe pauses or turns or, or the crowd parts just enough and she's able to get close enough to where she can reach out a hand so the bottom hem of his robe touches her fingers. Maybe he'll, he'll never even notice. Maybe she was thinking, if I just touch that, he'll never even know. <laughs> that is not how it worked. Maybe she thought that she would touch Jesus somehow or another. The hem of his garment is what she was shooting for. She touched that, something had happened. She'd sneak back out of the crowd. She'd go back to her house. She'd say, well, you know, I feel a little better, maybe just a little. And then maybe after a day or two, this issue of blood would, would diminish a little bit. Oh, I, th I think I'm getting better. I think things are finally turning around for me. And maybe after a week or two or, or three, maybe a month, and she'd be healed. That is not the way it's recorded in Scripture for us. What actually happened, according to Mark, not only was she immediately and miraculously fully healed. Let's just pause there for a moment. She was immediately, miraculously, and fully healed from a disease that had defied all of the treatments of all of the physicians that she could afford for over a decade. It's amen worthy in my opinion. This is power. But that isn't the only thing she got. She got a lot more than that. <clears throat> Mark says she was also miraculously given knowledge that she was fully healed. Now, I'm a little off script because Dave doesn't put this in his book. <clears throat> but we see, particularly if you look at the literal translations from the Greek, and I always like to, because I carry the NIV with me. I know it's got some weaknesses. So I always try to go look at like the new literal translation, other literal translations uh, more, uh, that are more word for word equivalent uh, to the Greek. In the NIV, it says she felt in her body. But in the more literal translations from the Greek, it, in, it identifies sureness of knowledge. So, so this isn't just, I kind of got a feeling. This is, I know for certain. Absolute, complete, full, total, and I'd say in the context of this miracle, miraculous knowledge that she was fully healed. Now, I'm okay with feelings, right? If, if the NIV version says she felt in her body she was healed, I'm okay with that, right? She's going to know something has changed. She's been suffering from this for a long time, and she's relieved. But that knowledge, that sureness, that certainty, that's, I think it relates pretty well to our hope seen piece. Jesus has given her, the Holy Spirit first, and then Jesus to follow, gave her certainty, it didn't fill her with arrogance. In fact, she still snuck away, even though she knew with absolute certainty that she was healed. She still slipped away. Now, we can only imagine, because the scripture doesn't record for us, we can only imagine the joy in her heart that she would have felt, because the first time in over 12 years, there's hope where there had not been hope before. She might have been, I would guess she was, very surprised or shocked by the suddenness and completeness of the healing. It happened. It was done. And she knew it. Could she have been so completely right in her faith in Jesus? But, but what did she do? Yeah, she's, she's like, does that not kind of do what we do like we've we've got a plan and we're going to follow through the plan even if something changes like uh, we we find the pearl of great price and we don't sell everything we have and buy the field you know uh we lose the coin and instead of sweeping the whole house looking for it we just go oh, it'll turn up <clears throat> uh, 
Isn't that just like us? Um, <laughs> well, let's turn to Jesus for a second. Always good to turn to Jesus. On his part, Jesus immediately knew that a healing had taken place. And he knew it because he felt the healing power go from him. And he was surprised by this event. He immediately stopped and asked, who touched his garments? Now this was a remarkable question and the apostles kind of call him out on it since the crowd around him was pressing in. They were crowding around him, jostling, you know. And it, How many of y'all have enjoyed uh, a third world crowd? Okay, we've got, we've got a few who've enjoyed a third world crowd. Now, in, in my experience, it's not just third world, but there are second world and first world groups that feel differently about our bubbles, our personal space. Uh, it, it can be very discomforting when someone is much closer than you think that maybe they should be. And they, you know, they're coming in and they're just saying, hey, it's really nice to, see, you know, they maybe get close enough to give it a little peck on the cheek uh, and you're like, Ugh. I am not comfortable with that. Uh, our, our bubble's personal space tends to be a little larger uh, than uh, crowds in this region at that time and in the present time. So there's that. Everybody's crowding in close. Another one of the wonders of the third world crowds are their rules about bathing habits, which are also interesting. Excessive on either side, people who just bathe in cologne and those who choose not to bathe hardly at all. I do recommend that, by the way. I do recommend having an opportunity to get into a crowd of people whose culture is different than yours. You get to know folks surprisingly well, surprisingly quickly, uh, in, in those kinds of crowds. Um, but you can get the picture, right? Jesus is there. It's a jostling crowd. It's, it's lively. People all around him uh, invading his personal space and touching and bumping into him and jostling him. But he kept looking around, Jesus did, to find the one who had touched him. This was not a moment that Jesus was going to let go of. He was going to use this moment to teach about faith. And he had to find who it was who had touched him. Now, somehow or another, and Scripture doesn't tell us how, but somehow or another, the woman figured out that Jesus was looking for her. And so in fear, she came forward and fell in front of him, admitting what she'd done. So what do you think she expected? Like, I know what I would have expected. I would have expected to be condemned for getting all these people unclean. That's what I'm thinking about. Like, I'm, I'm walking around, I'm basically like a leper, and I'm possibly exposing all these other people to my contagious disease, if it's contagious. I'm getting these people unclean, at least ceremonially unclean, so now they can't go and worship until they take care of whatever cleansing ritual they need, according to the law. That's what I would expect. Maybe she would expect that. I don't know. But what she got, no matter what she expected, what she got was the fulfillment of her hope. In Jesus' kind and compassionate words, where he said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. That's verse 34 of Mark 5. By searching this woman out, and by talking to her directly in this way, in front of everybody, Jesus provided her and the crowd, her and the crowd, with recognition that she had been fully healed and that she'd been fully restored to her community. All that she had dared to hope for, maybe even more, had been fulfilled with just one touch. Now we can learn a lot from this as we journey along our own paths through these waypoints towards hopefulness. We could learn about the Holy Spirit's power and in this case, how it worked independently. We can learn about resolute prayer and action. How a commitment and then an action are essential. We could even spend some time talking about Jesus being surprised. Could that even happen? How does that happen? <clears throat> but instead of those things, we're going to look at how a spark of hope led to fullness of hope. And maybe we could start with faith. Seems like a really good place to start. So what is faith? 
And it's never enough just to parrot scripture, although quoting scripture is always a good idea. But remember that the tempter quoted scripture to Jesus. So it's never enough just to quote scripture because we could go and say, well, faith is the evidence. And then go on. Or we could say faith, whatever. We could say all these things about faith that we could quote from scripture. But I like what Brother Layton does in his book. I say, this is me going off script a little, I think what he does in his book is he provides a functional description of faith. Not a textbook definition, but a functional description. So let me give you an example of a functional, de- uh, a functional description of something. In my area of expertise, I am a meteorologist. I have been a meteorologist for 35 years in the Air Force. I found functional descriptions of things in my career field to be very helpful. What is wind, someone might ask. Anyone? How about ask me? No, ask me. Ask me. Okay, what is air moving? What is wind? Okay, I'm really glad that you asked what, what wind is. Wind is the sum of the vector across a given distance of the intensity of the thermal gradient plus the intensity of the geostrophic gradient modified by the horizontal component of compressive or expansive vertical velocities modified again by friction if we're talking about wind close to the surface. There's so much more to it than that. Oh, I've built a 35-year career on describing what wind is, folks. Don't cheat me out of this science. But the thing is, if I'm talking to children about the wind... Or um, if I'm talking to people in the army about wind, like I've done for most of my career, uh, I use a functional description. What is the wind going to do? What problems is it going to cause for you? How is it going to affect your plans? For a child, it might be, are you able to fly a kite? For someone in the army, it might be, are you able to fly your helicopter? Similar. So think of faith, as Brother Leighton asks us to think of faith, I think. Think of it like you might think of wind. It's an environmental factor. It's the environment, faith that is, faith is the environment where our relationship with God begins. It's the place, the faith environment, is the place where our relationship is sustained. And faith is the environment where our relationship continues into leading to eternity. Faith is the element that if we don't have it, we won't be pleasing to God. That's Hebrews eleven six. So at first, faith starts with us getting to know God. We explore who God is, what he does for us, what he wants from us. And as we increase in our knowledge of God's perpetual and never failing faithfulness, we get to move beyond knowledge to something more powerful than just knowledge. Uh, here's an aside, I'm speaking Wednesday night on passion for knowledge, so don't think I'm just uh, saying uh, devaluing knowledge. Big fan of knowledge. You're going to hear more about that Wednesday night. Uh, But there's more, there's more than knowledge. And the knowledge uh, that we get as faith starts, it gives us reason to trust in God. And this isn't blind trust. As we come to know God, we have opportunity after opportunity to see how God is faithful to his promises to us. We hear from the community of faith how God is faithful to his promises to others. And all faithfulness means is that God will keep his promises. He will honor his promises and he stands by his promises. This is at the heart of our trust in God. And from this knowledge and this trust, we realize there's something that we have to do. So we have learned at the beginning part of our journey, and we have observed or sensed that God is perfectly faithful, and that teaches us to follow the example of Christ and the example of others by being faithful in our obedience to God. Obedience means that as we discover God's will, we put it into practice in our life. All right, there's a fancy term for this, some kind of um, humility I've used this word before. Es- not eschatological humility, but it's something, some kind of cool uh, uh, D-men word or, or um, uh, master's degree kind of word, not in my field. About the idea that when you come to God's word, you have to come to it with the humility that if you see something there 
that's different than what you think in here, this is what has to change. It's so, it's so arrogant. I'm speaking to myself. It's so arrogant to think that, no, no, that's not consistent with what I think. So obviously this is wrong. I can't even say it. I have to be humble enough that when I look here and I see what's here and it differs from what's here, this is what has to change. That's this idea of, of obedience, putting God's will into practice in our life. And it bears repeating, faith requires obedience. You can find that throughout the book of James. If you want to look at a specific spot, James 2, 14 through 19 is a good place to look. Now, obedience does not put God into our debt, as if that could happen. We're not earning our acceptance into God's presence because of how awesome we do things. Instead, no, we, what we're doing by doing stuff, by being obedient, is we're responding to his perfect example of loving and perfect faithfulness. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, as we've heard recently, um, helps us understand that more clearly. And we also know, though, that faith will be rewarded. We're not earning anything through our faith, through our obedience, but we do receive rewards. As we think about the woman in today's story, it might be easy to focus in on her desperate situation. Yeah, yeah, she was desperate. Um, but, but there's more to, though, than just desperation, because she resolved to act. So she was motivated by a power, a power that she heard about, that she believed in, the power of Jesus to heal. The Holy Spirit that dwelt in Jesus acted independently of Jesus' mortal will in recognition of this woman's resolute expression of faith in Jesus. And Jesus, as soon as he learned what had happened, of course, was in perfect agreement with the Holy Spirit. Jesus never rejected anyone who came to him in honest faith. And he frequently pointed it out, at times even marveling in it. Because faith is one of the most consistent teachings of Jesus. And frequently, um, it, he would identify it as being of the highest importance. <clears throat> What's noticeable in this situation with a woman 2,000 years ago, and noticeable today, is that Jesus doesn't demand a mature or complete faith before he acts to save. This woman had a mustard seed size faith. That's a, just a confusing statement. Jesus talks about the faith of the mustard seed. Her mustard seed faith was strong enough to bring her miraculous healing, miraculous knowledge of healing, and also a public restoration from Jesus himself. This woman... <clears throat> um, she also had an obligation, just like we do, to tell others. And we might worry about how we do that. We might not think we have the training or the skill or the speaking ability. There's nothing that we can see from Scripture that says this woman had training or skill in public speaking. What does she do? She's a second-class citizen by her gender in that culture, She's an outcast because of her disease, but this remarkable woman brings lasting and powerful glory to Jesus by saying what he did for her when she touched the fringe of his garment. How powerful was her testimony? I mentioned it before. In Matthew and Mark, a little bit later after this event, sick people everywhere were begging to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, which was exactly the thing that this woman had done and described in this crowd. There's not a one of us, here in this room or online, now or later, who can't tell what Jesus saved us from when we contacted his blood in the waters of baptism. So it's never enough just to receive the blessing. There's more. We must act. In the book of James, James teaching in the context of faith he speaks of the testing of our faith to build spiritual strength. But he tells us if we don't act on our faith, it's dead and worthless. James isn't telling us that God owes anything to us. Instead, he's challenging us to show the evidence that proves I have faith in Jesus. So when we find ourselves in desperate situations, maybe we feel that there's no hope. We decide to turn inward 
or we decide to just be busy. But instead, what we need to do, what we must do, is to drop the act, take off the mask, and to say out loud to those closest to Jesus, just like this woman did, she disclosed to those around what she suffered from and what Jesus did about it. We can do that very same thing. And when we do that thing, we're restored into the community of faith, but we also are providing a testimony so that others will know what it takes to be healed. So this event right here was not recorded in the Gospels as an afterthought. It's not a historical curiosity or it's not a medical journal entry. It's relevant today as we face desperate and hopeless situations. And there are many situations like that. Even among people who come to the Sunday morning auditorium class. Even to people who stand in front of the Sunday morning auditorium class to teach. There are desperate situations. Their situations seem hopeless. Our faith will be rewarded, but we have to act on our faith. And if we don't, we will stay desperate and hopeless. This woman, this remarkable woman demonstrates that to us. She was in a desperate situation, nowhere else to turn except to the one who might heal her. Just a small touch. Maybe made from a desperate act of faith, but it was enough for the full healing power of Jesus to go to her. And in her desperate act of faith, she felt the spark of hope turn into a sense of hope through her healing. And then she experienced seeing hope as Jesus restored not only her health, but her position as a welcome member of the community. And Jesus continues to meet our needs if we'll only turn to him in humble, obedient faith. And when we do, our most critical need, forgiveness of sins, is met. In this, we gain hope. We also gain peace and the promise to help through the storms of life. Thank you.